Good morning. I want to welcome you to our gathering of Southside Baptist today. It's good to see you here. It's good to be gathered to worship our God. He is worthy of worship. In just a moment, um, after a couple of announcements, I'm going to read from the book of Revelation chapter 5, and it is one of my favorite places in scripture that reminds us of, um, of who we are to worship and that he, the king, Jesus, is worthy of all worship. But it's good to have you here today. If you're a guest with us, we are glad that you've chosen to join us in worship. If you need something, ask somebody around you. We will be more than happy to serve you in any way that we can here today. Do you want to remind you of announcements that you've got there in your worship guide? Uh, we have some sign-ups going on for some different things. Uh, we do have our egg hunt coming up in less than two weeks, and if you would like to um, uh, provide some sweet treats for that, let um, me clarify that announcement. I had some questions last week. This is like some maybe some homemade goods that we would eat right then at the, and notice I said we, okay, that we would eat right then at, at, the, um, at the egg hunt. We will provide, our church will provide the little goodies and those kinds of things that we'll send home with them, candies and that kind of thing. But if you want to bring some cupcakes or something like that or some Rice Krispies treats or, you know me, chocolate chip cookies always works. Um, and, uh, and so I know it's for the kids. It's for the kids. Um, but uh, but um, it, listen, if, if Jackie can sneak brownies before Sunliners, um, sorry, I told on you. <laughs> I can sneak chocolate chip cookies at the egg hunt. <laughs> Somebody had to check them out. I agree. I'm glad you did. It just, I mean, it, it just made me more confident when I went over there and grabbed me a few of them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so, uh, we, we do want you, if you can, to uh, help out with that. A lot of you have already signed up to help, but I just wanted to clarify that. And then invite children uh, to that event. Um, and there's more information in your worship guide about that. And then we have our men's ministry rally coming up. Uh, lots of different ways that you could help with that. And um, announcement is in your worship guide. And I'll let you take a look at it. If you have questions, I'll be glad to uh, try to answer those. And there's some other guys uh, that you can um, ask as well. Uh, but uh, that men's min ministry rally is coming up at the end of the month. I also want to mention that uh, around Easter uh, time each year is when we collect our uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering. If you're unfamiliar with what that offering is, um, it's named after a lady who was a missionary here in North America, Annie Armstrong. And, uh, and it's an offering where 100% of that money goes to church planting, uh, missionary like disaster relief and chaplaincy type uh, ministries um, and, uh, and, and, and all, all, really all sorts of missionary opportunities here in North America. And, um, and you know as well as I know that the lostness right around us seems to be growing uh, daily. And, um, and so it's imperative that we get the gospel to those here in our country and in North America and then as we always uh, give at Christmas time um, to uh, missions work all around the world. But it is our season of Annie Armstrong offering and so there's information in your worship guide about how you can give. We'll be taking that, that offering uh, through the month of April. And I just wanted to remind you of that and I pray that the Lord would, uh, would help us to give uh, faithfully and sacrificially and cheerfully uh, to the work that he's doing um, all around North America. We have um, thousands of people serving as church planners, missionaries, chaplains, and our military, and in different places um, right here in North America. And uh, it's just a great opportunity for us to continue to do the work that God's called us to do uh, through giving. I want to read, as I said, from Revelation chapter 5. And church family, we, we constantly need to be reminded of who sits on the throne. We need to be reminded of that. And it's because we always have this temptation facing us each and every day that we would try to be the king, that we would try to be the queen of our own lives, that we would call the shots, and that we would seek to live our lives for our own glory. But one of my favorite passages in the scripture is Revelation chapter 5, and John, with his vision of heaven, sees one who is a lamb, standing as though he had been slain, which means this is Jesus Christ. And here's what we see this picture of. They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you, that's to the Lamb who's on the throne, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then John writes, I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. 
And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And, el- and the elders fell down and worshipped. May that be true of us here as we long for that day when we get to see the Lamb seated on the throne. It doesn't mean we're to wait until that day to worship the Lamb who is on the throne. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we have gathered here today, our desire is that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb who is slain, would be exalted in our hearts and in this place through our church today. Father, there is only one King, and His name is Jesus. And Lord, that passage, while it does call us to celebrate And to live for this king who is on the throne, King Jesus. God, it's also a reminder of how often we fail to give you the the, the worship that you are worthy of. Father, even, even from the fact that this lamb had to be slain. That the marks of our sin are visible upon Jesus in heaven. God, may that truth humble us. God, that if any, in any way we think that somehow we are worthy of your love, God, that you would remove that thought from us. That somehow we are deserving of salvation, that you would remove that wicked thought from us. God, if we would to, were to come in here today arrogantly thinking that in and of ourselves, we can give you the wor- worship that you are worthy of. God, remove that evil and vile thought far from us. God, because every single human being around that throne one day will be there only because the king left his throne and came to earth to die for our sins. And to provide us with a free gift of salvation that we in no way deserve. So God, with that picture of King Jesus, with nail scars in his hands and his feet, and a spear scar in his side, emblazoned upon our minds and our hearts, God, with that picture of Jesus, There on the throne, God, would you help us to worship you today? And not only today, but God, every moment of our lives. God, as redeemed people, may we bow in submission to Jesus all the time, everywhere, no matter who is around. Father, if there's anyone here today who has never bowed in submission to King Jesus, God, I pray that that picture of him on the throne, the king who died for their sin, God, that through that picture, you would draw their hearts to Jesus, even right now, to believe in him for salvation. God, through the preaching of your word in just a few moments, through the singing, as we lift our voices in praise to this king, through our prayers, through our giving, through our obedient response by your grace to your word. God, may you receive the worship that you are worthy of as Jesus is exalted, our King. And it's in the name of our King, Jesus, the Lamb who is slain, that we pray. Amen. Will you stand together this morning as we start to sing, O Worship the King.
go back and I want to sing that first verse one more time where we sing, O oh, worship the King. And let's sing it in a way that's worthy of the Lamb who is seated on the throne. Let's lift our voices in praise one more time with that first verse, O oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King, O oh, glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilions in splendor and guarded with praise. Amen. You can be seated. One of the things that um, we have been tasked with doing, and all of us have a role in this um, as, as adults, is making sure that the next generation uh, grows up singing, Oh, worship the King, um, celebrating that Christ is the King, the Lamb who was slain that has risen from the dead. And um, our parents are given primary responsibility of that as the Lord entrusts children into our homes. And so, um, some of you have already received this, and some of you I didn't have a chance to make it to, um, but make sure you take this home with you, parents, um, uh, when you leave today. I've got a book that I wanted to give to each of our uh, families, and it's really probably um, ages kind of elementary school and under. Uh, but if you have older children, or if you just happen to want one, uh, make sure all the families with children like fifth grade and under get one first. And, um, and then if we run out, I'll be glad to get more. Um, I just kind of guessed on how many we needed. Um, but this is a book to um, help walk your, your children through the Easter season. And uh, so what you'll do is you'll start next Sunday on Palm Sunday, and uh, you'll start with this part of the book, which is called The Darkest Night, Darkest Night. And, um, and so for seven days, Palm Sunday through the day before Easter, that Saturday, there'll be a little story uh, from God's Word and a few questions. Uh, it's only about a page and a half long, each of those uh, chapters, if you will. And then on Easter Sunday, and I think this is really cool, this is the kid in me coming out, you'll flip the book over like this, and it's the brightest day. So the darkest night and the brightest day. Darkest night obviously dealing with uh, the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus and the brightest day, beginning with the resurrection of Jesus and uh, going through some of the events um, in the following weeks after Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's seven days from Easter Sunday through the Saturday after Easter. Um, now you can do it however you want. You don't have to do it each day or you can spread it over however you want to do that. But that's what it's designed for. Uh, for Palm Sunday through the Saturday after Easter. And so uh, make sure um, if you have kids or grandchildren um, and that, uh, that you're taking care of, or, um, and, and really I open up to anybody, just make sure, uh, we'll, I want to make sure that our families with those like fifth grade and under uh, get a copy of this. And then if, you, if we run out, I'll be glad to order as many as, as we need. Um, but I've already read through the whole book, and um, it is wonderful. And so just a little resource for our families um, as you walk your children through the Easter season and making sure they know uh, who Jesus is while we celebrate Easter, that he has died for our sins and that he is alive today. And that makes a difference um, for our lives each and every day. And so um, make sure, families, you get a copy of this um, on your way out. They are stacked up on the table in the foyer. Some of you already received yours. And if you go out there and there's no more left, make sure you find me. And um, I will make sure uh, as best I can you get one um, as soon as I can get it to you. All right, we're going to continue to sing about our king and uh, as the church, and so let's continue to worship him. Y'all stand back up. Ephesians 2 says, He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, he being Jesus. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Let's sing cornerstone this morning. Spilled on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
Church family, I invite you to open up to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20, our text for today. God's word is so good, so thankful for it. Hope you're thankful for his word today. Genesis chapter 20 is our text that we're going to study, but first let's read it. Let's hear from God. You follow along in your copy. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to, to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see? that you did this thing. Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. 
Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do to do me at every place to which we come. Say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. So to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Heavenly Father, would you help us to learn from your word today? And then, Lord, as we learn, help us to learn to love you more. And as we love you more, Father, may we put your word into practice in our lives. May we be obedient to all that your word calls us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard of the Witness Protection Program? Have you ever heard of that? Probably so. Um, at least in the movies, right? The Witness Protection Program began in 1971, and its mission is to provide, and I'll quote from the the information I have, so I'll make sure I get it right. Their, Their mission is to provide, quote, for the security, health, and safety of government witnesses and their immediate dependents whose lives are in danger as a result of their testimony against drug traffickers, terrorists, organized crime members, and other major criminals. In other words, this program provides protection for people who are going to testify against some pretty bad criminals. And because they're going to testify against them, their lives are in danger, and so they are provided um, uh, with this protection program, the witness protection program. And the people tasked with the job of protecting these witnesses are called U.S. Marshals. And I found this description of the U.S. Marshals in regard to their role in the Witness Protection Program. Quote, the U.S. Marshals provide 24-hour protection to all witnesses while they are in a high-threat environment, including pre-trial conferences, trial testimonies, and other court appearances. Now, now why do these witnesses need this 24-hour protection? Why not just when they show up at the, at the courthouse? to give their, um, give their statement, to, to provide their testimony. Well, it's because those wishing to do them harm are constantly plotting and scheming against them. Attacks against these witnesses could come from anywhere and at any time, and so 24-hour protection is needed. And thankfully, the U.S. Marshals are there to provide 24-7 protection so that the testimony of these witnesses can be preserved, can be protected. Church, when we read a passage like Genesis chapter 20, in light of the overarching storyline of Genesis and the rest of the Bible, I think that one of the main things we ought to take from it is that the promises of God must be preserved against the scheming and plotting of the enemy who is always seeking to destroy these promises anywhere and any time that he can launch an assault. Because God's promises have to do with people, And because people are prone to sin, and because there is an enemy in our world who hates God and hates God's people, God's promises exist in what we could call a high-threat environment. God's promises exist in a high-threat environment, but thankfully God offers 24-hour-a-day protection for His promises that He has made. Sometimes the attacks against God's promises are big and bold, such as Cain killing Abel in Genesis chapter 4. Or if we want to take Abraham's life, for example, a pretty big attack against the promises of God was Sarah talking her husband Abraham into having a child with Hagar, which we studied back in chapter 16. It was pretty, pretty bold and brazen. But sometimes the attacks are a little more subtle, where we wouldn't really consider them maybe an attack on God's promise. And that's what we find in Genesis chapter 20. And here in chapter 20, we find that a half-truth almost derails God's plan, except that it doesn't because God is in complete control and is carefully protecting his promise 24-7. No attack on God's promise slips slips past his watchful eye. 
no matter how subtle. Church, Genesis chapter 20 teaches us that God carefully works to protect his promise against every scheme of the enemy. God carefully works to protect his promise against every scheme of the enemy. Now, I don't know what comes into your mind when you read a passage like Genesis chapter 20. What came into your mind as we were reading it just a moment ago. But here's what comes into my mind if I'm not careful. When I read something like Genesis chapter 20 in God's word. This is what, this is what can sometimes come to my mind. I think, well, that was an interesting little story. Kind of weird, but interesting. And a good reminder of the importance of telling the truth and the mess that you can get in if you don't and if you marry your brother or your sister. Okay, keep moving on. And then I go to chapter 21 and chapter 22, and I really don't give chapter 20 any more thought. In fact, I joked with someone this week who asked me how I would be preaching Genesis chapter 20, and I said this. Point number one, don't marry your sister unless you're willing to call her your wife. Point number two, don't believe a man who says that the woman he's living with is his sister. And point number three, don't marry your brother. But that's not the points that we're going to share with you today, okay? Uh, my actual point in saying that was, was really a confession. It was to say that sometimes it's difficult to understand exactly what God is trying to teach us in a passage like this. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story, but, but what in the world is God trying to teach us? It's easy to read it, scratch our heads, and just move on. But if we read carefully, and we think carefully, and if we make sure we're reading a passage like this in its broader context, I believe that what we see is that really there's more going on here than initially meets the eye. Which, if you think about it, really, church, is the case for all of life. There's often more going on than meets the eye. Behind the physical realm where, where we clearly see brokenness and the effects of sin, there's a spiritual realm where Satan is at work attacking the promises of God and God is at work 24-7 protecting his promises. Behind the mess of humanity is Satan who is seeking to derail God's promise and there is the one true God who is protecting his promises all the time. I want to share with you three truths today regarding what maybe we could call God's promise protection program. God's promise protection program. Now, before we get to those, I want to make sure we remember the context because it's so important. When we come to a passage like this and we just uh, kind of say, interesting story, let's keep going, one of the reasons that we don't see what I think God wants us to see is that we've just seen it as just Genesis chapter 20, just one story. But it is a part of a larger story, and we've got to remember that context. In Genesis 3, remember, God had promised to send a man born of woman, so we're looking for this promised son, who would destroy the enemy, destroy the serpent. And then in Genesis 12, God calls out this man named Abraham, and he promises to give him land and an offspring. That should make us think back to the promised son, the seed, the promised offspring. He's going to provide this, this uh, man named Abraham with blessing and protection, and, uh, and he's going to bless all the families of the earth through him. And then in Genesis 17, God promised that Abraham would have a son by his wife, Sarah. Makes that promise very specific, despite the fact that they're both really old and Sarah is, Sarah is barren. And then in Genesis chapter 18, God promised that the child will be born about a year from then. So, I mean, these promises are getting more and more specific. You will have a child, Abraham, with your wife, Sarah, and it's going to happen within the next year. Now we get to Genesis 20, we're still within that year, and we learn that Abraham has left the land of Canaan. He's traveled to Gerar, which we learn at the end of chapter 21 is the land of the Philistines. One thing we realize is that even though God promised Abraham a land many years later, God still not, uh, got not uh, fulfilled that promise. Abraham's a wanderer. He's a sojourner. He just moves from place to place, and that is, ends up being his whole life. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham had faith that God would provide a heavenly land one day, and so it seems that Abraham was content with being a sojourner. He shows some faith there, but... Despite his faith in God's promises, Abraham did not always act with faith. We see him go down to Gerar, and there he meets the king, whose name is Abimelech. And apparently, Abimelech sees Sarah, and he wants to marry Sarah. And so, to keep from being killed by Abimelech, because that's what Abraham assumes, and remember that word, assumes, is going to happen to him if Abimelech founds out that he's married to Sarah, and Sarah wants, uh, Abimelech wants Sarah, so why do I do that? Well, I'll just kill her husband. 
So that's what Abraham assumes is going to happen. Abraham tells Abimelech that Sarah is his sister. Then Abimelech takes Sarah with the intention of marrying her. But we see that God intervenes. God strikes Abimelech with some sort of sickness, and he closes all the wombs of Abimelech's household. So all the women now cannot have children. It's to get Abimelech's attention. Hey, something has happened that's not right. You're now sick with this sickness that's going to lead to death, and, and basically your household is going to die out because I've closed all the wombs in your household. And then God appears to Abimelech in a dream. Here's the first truth that I want to share with you, church regarding God's protection of his promise. It's this, the omniscient God protects his promise from human ignorance. The omniscient God protects his promise from human ignorance. Now the word omniscient is a fancy word that means all-knowing. It means God knows everything. He is all-knowing. Nothing is outside of his knowledge. And, and, then, and then by the word ignorance, we just mean really the opposite when we don't know something. When we act out of ignorance, we are acting out of, out of a lack of information. We don't know. But God knows everything. Now, God appears to Abimelech in a dream, and, and notice what God says. He says, behold, you are a dead man. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if, 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 God, if God ever says to you, behold, you are a dead man, you, you better pay attention to that. And he says, because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. And then the text tells us in verse 4 that Abimelech had not approached her yet. That doesn't necessarily mean he hadn't talked to her. I'm sure that had happened. But that means that he had not had physical relations with Sarah yet. And so Abimelech goes right in in this dream to pleading his case with God. I mean, God just said, you're a dead man. He says, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. Before you strike me down, hold on, hold on, hold on. He says, Lord, will you kill an innocent man? Did he, talking about Abraham, not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. In other words, here's Abimelech saying, Lord, it would be wrong of you to punish me. I didn't know Sarah was Abraham's wife. I was ignorant of that fact. Therefore, I'm innocent of this immoral act. Please don't kill me. Now, in, in, a, in a way... His plea sounds similar to Abraham's plea back in Genesis chapter 18 where Abraham is pleading on behalf of Lot in the city of Sodom and he says, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? It's a beautiful truth here that this king that's not a part of the chosen people of God recognizes that this God who has appeared to him in the dream will act justly. And so he pleads on the basis of God's justice and says, hold on God, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know. Now notice God's response. In verses 6 through 7, God says, yes. And notice what God says. Abraham is, uh, excuse me, Abimelech has basically just said, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm ignorant. I'm ignorant. And God says, yes, I know. I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Now notice with me a, a few things that we can learn, I think, from God's response to Abimelech's plea. We're not going to talk about all these things in detail, but at least want us to, to mention them. First, just notice that God continues to act justly. He always does what is right, as he did in Genesis chapter 18, as he did in Genesis chapter 19. He does so in Genesis chapter 20. He does what is right. Second, we see that God hates adultery. Regardless of the nation or the culture, it is a sin in God's sight. It is a violation of God's design for marriage. He said, behold, you are a dead man because you have taken another man's wife. Third, we see for the first time in Genesis that Abraham is called a prophet. Quite interesting and quite a highlight of the goodness and grace and mercy of God that in a passage that paints Abraham in such a negative light, this is the one place in Genesis where Abraham is called a prophet. Now, Abraham has already acted as a prophet in chapter 18 when he, when he interceded on Lot's behalf. That's what prophets did. And so he, was, he had been acting as a prophet, but here we see that Abraham is called a prophet. A fourth thing we see is that God takes sin seriously. He takes all sin seriously. Just as he told Adam in the garden, he tells Abimelech that if he sins by not giving Sarah back to Abraham, Abraham he will, and you'll remember these words from Genesis chapter three, excuse me, 2, 
you shall surely die. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, he told Adam. He's telling Abimelech the same thing. Listen, God's attitude towards sin never changes. Fifth, we see that our sin impacts those around us. Not only will Abimelech die if he fails to obey, obey God, but all who belong to him, his household, will also perish. That doesn't necessarily mean that God's going to strike them down immediately, but remember, we know from the end of this chapter that God had closed all the wombs in his household, which means eventually, sooner or later, they're going to die off. Abimelech's household is going to perish. And so his, this sin, that if it continues, is going to affect not just him, but those around him. I think it's a good, quick reminder that, friends, our sin doesn't just impact us. It impacts those around us. And so we ought to proceed with caution when we find ourselves being tempted by our enemy. But the focus of this text seems to be what God says concerning God's action. The focus here is what God says he has done. The focus is God's omniscience despite human ignorance. Abimelech admits his ignorance. He says, listen, I didn't know. I didn't know I was clueless. And God says, yes, but I did. I did know. I did know everything that was happening in the midst of your ignorance. I knew what was happening. And it was I, God says, who kept you from sinning against me. Now, as we read later, it seems that the way God prevented Abimelech from approaching Sarah was by inflicting him with some sort of really bad sickness and illness that was going to lead to his death. Not just a runny nose, right? I mean, he had some kind of bad sickness, and that had prevented him from having already approached Sarah. God was the one who sent that illness into his life to protect him from that sin because God knew. God knew what was going on. The church, he wasn't just protecting Abimelech. This is where we've got to see the bigger picture. God was protecting his promise. God was protecting his promise. Remember, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a biological son of their own. And we know from Scripture that this biological son was the son of promise who had continued this family line that would ultimately lead to the promised deliverer of Genesis chapter 3, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. This entire debacle, and I think we could call it that in Genesis chapter 20, this entire debacle with Abraham put that promise in jeopardy. If that promise is to be fulfilled the way God has said it's going to be fulfilled, if he is going to be proven to be a God who always keeps his word, then Abraham and Sarah need to have a child. Not Abimelech and Sarah. And so God is protecting not only Abimelech from sinning, but he is also protecting his promise from being derailed by Abimelech's ignorance. Abimelech didn't know, but thankfully, church, the God who knows all things did know, and he intervened to protect his promise. And so, church, when it comes to trusting God and his promises, we can have 100% confidence that those promises will always be protected because God is never going to be ca caught off guard because he is omniscient. He knows everything, and he uses his omniscience to protect his promises from the schemes of the enemy who uses human ignorance as a part of his arsenal to attack God's promise. But praise God, human ignorance is no match for the omniscience of our great God. And so the omniscient God protects his promise from human ignorance. The second truth we see regarding God's promise protection program is this. The faithful God protects his promise from human faithlessness. The faithful God protects his promise from human faithlessness. So far, the story is focused really on Abimelech, but now we see the focus begins to shift to none other than Abraham. None other than Abraham. Remember, God has been speaking to Abimelech in a dream. The text tells us that the next morning he gets up, and he gets up early. Because if God appears to you in a dream and says, you shall surely die unless you do whatever it is that I'm telling you to do, you better wake up early, right? You better get up early. And so he gets up early, and he calls his servants, and he tells his servants, the people in his household, exactly what God has said. And we know that his servants then take God seriously because verse 8 tells us that the men were very much afraid. They took God's word seriously. They said, uh-uh, we don't want this to happen. 
We believe God has the power to do that. We're very afraid. And so then Abimelech calls Abraham in for questioning. And Abimelech asks Abraham two questions. Then he makes an accusation against Abraham. And then he asks a third question. He asks two questions, then makes an accusation, and then asks a third question. So question number one seems pretty obvious. What have you done to us? That's his first question to Abraham. Question number two. How have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? So he starts with a broad question, what have you done to us? Then he says, what have I done to you that you would do this to me and to my kingdom? And then he makes an accusation. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And then question number three, what did you see? that you did this thing. So Abraham gets brought in. He gets interrogated by the king. The king is very straightforward. He takes God's warning seriously, and he confronts Abraham and says, what have you done? What have I done to you? What you have done is not the right thing, not what should have been done. And once again, what are, what are, what are, what are you doing? What's going on here? Now it's Abraham's turn to respond, and what we see is that Abraham just simply tries to excuse his actions. I don't, I don't think we can see it as anything other than that. He's trying to excuse his actions. And Abraham comes out of this questioning looking less than stellar in his character. The, the, the king of the Philistines, Abimelech, comes out looking much more like a servant of God in this passage than God's chosen man, Abraham. And so Abraham's excuses boil down to this. Number one, a false assumption. Number two, fear for his own life. Number three, deception using a half-truth. And number four, past precedent. So he makes his case, and it's just this kind of hodgepodge of stuff that he seems like he's just trying to say, okay? And it's a false assumption, fear for his own life, the deception of a half-truth, and past precedent. So excuse number one, the false assumption. He says, I did it because I thought... There is no fear of God at all in this place. If you remember earlier I said that he assumed that he would be killed if, we, if he went into, into that uh, place and said, this is my wife. He assumed that. And so now he tells Abimelech like that. He said, well, reason number one, I thought people here, they don't care about God. And so they're not going to care about murdering me. And so I'm going to be murdered. But it was a false assumption. Once again, Abraham doesn't know. He, does not, he is not all-knowing. God is. And so he assumes something false. Excuse number two. Fear for his own life. I thought they will kill me because of my wife. They will kill me because of my wife. Fear for his own life. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with taking appropriate steps to preserve one's life, but Abraham has done so by lying, leading his wife into sin, and leading another man into sin with consequences that are going to affect that man's entire kingdom. And he's worried about his life. Just his life. Excuse number three. The deception of a half-truth. He says, besides, she is indeed my sister. In other words, I really didn't lie to you. Not totally. She really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So what we learn here for the first time in Genesis is that Abraham and his wife Sarah are actually, in fact, half-siblings. They have the same father, Terah, but they have different mothers. Now, when we read that today, we say, gross. That is not supposed to happen. They should not be married. And no, that should not happen today. But God doesn't forbid in his word marrying your very close relative, even as close as your brother or your sister. He does not forbid that until he gives the law in the book of Exodus, which was over 400 years after Genesis chapter 20 took place. And so that was not a sin. It was not wrong for Abraham to be married to Sarah. It is wrong today, very clearly. God even spells that out in his word later. Um, and later, if you have questions, we could talk about why that wasn't, uh, wasn't wrong for them to do uh, back in Genesis chapter 20. But that's not the problem. The problem is not that Abraham is married to his half-sister. The problem is that he deceived Abimelech with a half-truth. And a half-truth is a whole lie, no matter how you cut it. Excuse number four, past precedent. Remember, he's trying to state his case. He's trying to give his excuses of why he's done what he's done and put a whole nation at risk. Past precedent. 
Precedent means basing your present decision on how you've acted in the past. He says, and when God calls me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. And so basically, basically Abraham admits to treating everyone on his 20 year, 20 plus year sojournings the way that he's treated Abimelech. That's why he said, hey, I've been treating everybody this way. And he seems to think that this justifies his actions. And we know this is the case, that this isn't the first time he's done this, because we've already seen Abraham do this back in Genesis chapter 12 when he did the same thing to Pharaoh in Egypt. If you've forgotten that, you can go back and read that story later. So those are Abraham's excuses. I mean, this last one. Well, I'm just going to keep deceiving people because that's what I've, all, what I've been doing the past 20 years. But friends, just because you've been deceiving people doesn't mean it's right to keep deceiving people. Those are his excuses. I think it's safe to say that Abimelech appears to be the better, better man in this particular instance. This is not a high point in Abraham's life, to say the least. And I think what, the way the text is written, what it reveals to us, what it highlights to us, is that Abraham is not a perfect man. And though he is a man of faith, his faith is not perfect. And there are definitely moments in his life where his faithlessness shines through. It is an occasion of faithlessness on the part of Abraham, but as we have seen in previous chapters, the God who has called Abraham, made promises to Abraham, covenanted with Abraham, and chosen Abraham uses moments of faithlessness in the lives of his people to shine a spotlight on his faithfulness. That's what our God does. And so this is an occasion not only of Abraham's faithlessness, but of God's faithfulness to Abraham. God doesn't turn his back on Abraham. He still calls him a prophet in this chapter. A few verses later, we're going to see that he listens to Abraham's prayer, and he answers Abraham's prayer. Despite Abraham's faithfulness, faithlessness, excuse me, God remains faithful to his promises. God has promised Abraham a son by his wife. What does Abraham do? Give his wife to another man. What does that do? Jeopardize the promise. What does God do? He makes the man give Abraham his wife back, thus protecting his promise. Church, all throughout Genesis, all throughout the rest of Scripture, we see the faithfulness, faithlessness of God's people put God's promises in jeopardy. And church, we see it in our own lives today. With our own faithlessness, our own faithlessness often appears to put God's promises in jeopardy. God has promised to make us holy and present us as a spotless bride one day. But I don't know about you, but I can look at my life and I can see that I don't always look, whole, look holy. I don't always look spotless. I don't always walk in faith before God. But God has promised that he will present his church to God as a spotless bride. Sometimes in our sin, we're tempted to doubt God's faithfulness to us when we see our faithlessness. Have you ever been there? Where you know that you've messed up, and in that moment you doubt that God could still love you, and that he would still be faithful to his promises to you? But God has promised to keep to the end everyone who has believed in Jesus for salvation. Listen to Paul's words to the church in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. That means make you holy and spotless. Sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Praise God, his faithfulness protects his promise from human faithlessness. Church, if you're not rejoicing in that today... You better start rejoicing in it because that is our only hope of our salvation being completed one day is that God remains faithful despite our faithlessness. Third truth that we see regarding God's promise protection program is this. Church, the sovereign God protects his promise from accusations of illegitimacy. I know that's a mouthful. But that's, that's what we see here in the final verses of this passage. The sovereign God I mean, it's the God who is in control over all protects his promise from accusations of illegitimacy. In the final section of this chapter, we see Abimelech not only returns Sarah, but we see him give Abraham all sorts of gifts. He gives him the invitation to dwell wherever he wants to in his land. And to top it off, he gives Abraham a thousand pieces of silver. Now, if you go back, and, and people that are much smarter than me 
kind of know what the currency was in that day. This is like, this is like a, 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 a laborer's wage for about 160 years. Okay, This is an enormous amount of money that he gives over to Abraham. And in response, Abraham prays to God. And what does God do? God heals and God opens. God heals Abimelech of the sickness he had apparently afflicted him with. And God opens the wombs of all the women in Abimelech's households so that now they can have children and Abimelech's family, his line, will be preserved. So we see here God keep his word to Abimelech to keep him and his household from death if he gave Sarah back. But there again, we see more is going on than meets the eye. Why does Abimelech do what he does? Well, one reason is obviously God told him to, or you're going to die. I mean, that's a pretty good reason. If that's the only reason, that's a good enough reason in and of itself for him to do what he does. But another reason for all the gifts could be to appease any anger. Hey, I don't want Abraham to be mad at me, and apparently Abraham is a prophet of this God who said he's going to kill me, so I'm going to give him some extra stuff, make sure I can try to, you know, make sure everybody's happy with me. And I'm sure that might have been a reason as well. But then the text specifically tells us the reason for the thousand pieces of silver. Verse 16, to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother, which is also her husband, a thousand pieces of silver. Notice what he says. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. In other words, he gives all this money over as proof that he did not have physical relations with Sarah. And this is where it's vital that we study a passage like this in its context. Sarah's innocence must be validated in order for God's promise to not be called into question with accusations of illegitimacy. Why? Within the year, Sarah is going to have a son. And God has said, this will be the son of promise. But the legitimacy of this child could be called into question if everyone thinks that Sarah's been living with Abimelech. And so we actually really know whose child this is. It's not yours, Abraham. This is Abimelech's. If Sarah's innocence is not vindicated, then her son, whom she and Abraham would claim belonged to them, might be questioned as illegitimate. And if the son is considered illegitimate, then God's promise would be questioned as illegitimate. But the omniscient and the faithful God is also sovereign in control over all he is always in control and we have seen and we will continue to see that evil never has nor never will thwart god's plan god was going to protect his promise from accusations of illegitimacy when sarah gave birth several months later there would be no doubt that this child was the child of abraham and sarah this child was the child of promise and this was the continuation of god's promise to send a man born of woman who would be the deliverer who would destroy the enemy that man of course is jesus the son of god because god protected his promise jesus has come he has died in our place he has absorbed god's wrath on our behalf so that everyone who believes in jesus will be saved. That's what I mean when I say more is going on than initially meets the eye. Genesis 20 is about God protecting that promise. And church, God is still protecting his promises from accusations of illegitimacy. You see, Satan would seek to use our sin against us, our faithlessness against us. He would seek to accuse us of not being fit for heaven. Our sin is a tool in Satan's tool bag to try to destroy God's promises. But when Satan says, look at that man's sin. God, look at that woman's sin. Obviously, he's not your child, God. Obviously, she's not your child, God. When Satan tries to accuse us of being illegitimate members of God's family, church, the sovereign God says, I chose this man, I chose this woman in Christ before the foundation of the world. My son poured out his blood as a redemption price to purchase this person out of every single sin that he or she would ever commit. And my spirit has sealed her as a guarantee, has sealed him as a guarantee of their inheritance until they acquire possession of it to the praise of my glory. I'm simply quoting from Ephesians chapter 1. God says, this is my child forever. 
Church, every day God is protecting his salvation promises to you and to me from accusations of illegitimacy. Sometimes we act in ignorance, but God is omniscient. Sometimes we act in faithlessness, but God is faithful. And sometimes our ignorance and our faithlessness might lead to God's promises being accused of illegitimacy, but God is sovereign over all. Our only hope in a world that seems out of control with sin, and sometimes our lives seem that way, is that God is sovereign and He uses His sovereignty, He uses His control to bring about His promises of salvation. There's a psalm that actually recounts the wondrous works of God in calling out His people and fulfilling His promises to them. That's not the the surprising part. There are many psalms that do that. But it actually talks about Genesis chapter 20 in that psalm. God wanted his people to remember this story and he wanted them to give him glory, to give him thanks for what he did in Genesis chapter 20. He wanted them to see that he was responsible for protecting his promise. So Psalm chapter 105, we find these verses. When there were few in number of a little account, he's talking about his people, and sojourners in it. There's Abraham, sojourner, wanderer wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress him. Notice what he says. He rebuked kings on their account. He's talking about Abimelech. That's what he's talking about. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. God put that in a psalm for his people hundreds of years later to remember Genesis chapter 20 for the purpose of them saying, God gets all the credit for any of the promises and all of the promises that he has made to us and for fulfilling those promises to us. It's not because of us. It's because of God, his faithfulness, his omniscience over all, his sovereign control of this world. Friends, the attacks against God's promises come in all different shapes and sizes, and ultimately they come from Satan himself. But reigning over Satan in this world is this omniscient, faithful, and sovereign God who will protect his promises 24-7, anytime, anywhere. He stands ready to protect his promises. Yes, God's promises live in a high-threat environment, but God's program of protecting his promises will not fail because it is God who is the one standing guard. It is God who is the one who is protecting his promises. And so, Christian, I want you to rest assured that if you have believed in Christ Jesus, your salvation is secure. Your sins have been forgiven. Jesus is coming back to get you. The trials of this life are temporary, and heaven is our home. These promises from God are safe and secure because he is watching over them, he is guarding them, and he is protecting them. But these promises are only for those who have believed in this promised one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you have not believed in the son who would come from the line of Abraham and Sarah, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not trusted in him, then you must. That's the only way that you can enjoy these protected promises of God forever. You must believe in him. God carefully works to protect his promise against every scheme of the enemy. And so, church, I want to close with these absolutely amazing and comforting and encouraging verses from the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then he says this, let us hold fast this confession of our hope without wavering, Because he who promised is faithful. Church, would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much. That even though we often fail you, and this this truth that you protect your promises is no way a license to sin. This is no way an excuse for us to just willingly walk into sin. Lord, we want to run towards holiness because that's what Jesus died to make us, is holy. But God, we confess that 
we don't always act holy. We don't always honor the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. And yet, God, you are faithful. God, there's an enemy who would seek to destroy us, but God, you know all of his schemes because you know everything and nothing that he throws against us surprises you. So you are ready to fend them off for our good and for your glory. God, we can hold fast the confession of our hope, our confession that Jesus Christ has died for us and he alone is the way that we can have an eternal relationship with you. And we hold fast that confession of our hope, placing all of our trust in Christ and having confidence that our salvation is secure because you who promise our faith, you will surely do it. We saw you protecting your promise back in Genesis chapter 20 throughout the pages of Scripture. And God, we see you protecting your promises in our lives today. And we just want to say thank you. And we want to live our lives for your glory. For the glory of the omniscient, faithful, and sovereign God. In Jesus' name we pray. Will you stand this morning as we reflect and respond with, Lord, I need you. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you When I can 
this last song. It's called This Is My Father's World. And as we sing it, rejoice, rejoice that God is sovereign over all. That God is sovereign over all. We're going to sing this in verse 3. We're going to sing this line, that though the wrong Mm -hmm. seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Let's sing this celebrating what Christ has done. Father, we thank you so much for your word, which speaks life into our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit, all because Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross. And so we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. Lord, help us to go out now as missionaries for you, declaring this good news that you have awesome promises and that you are protecting those promises for all who believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. Lord, help us to live out what we say we believe this week. In Jesus' name we pray.